Okie dokie. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll um, speak about the crypt technologies for everyone. And Julie Van Dam is the Associate Professor of French uh, teaching in the Department of French and Italian at USC. And she will be guiding us through the different ways in which uh, we can help students to make the classroom more inclusive. Julie. Thank you so much, Liana. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. And um, the first thing I wanna do is drop, oops, that did not, sorry, 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 ha, ha, ha. Um, I'm dropping the, um, I'm dropping the PDF into the chat. Um, I'm just having, sorry, <laughs> that's my first technical difficulty. Um, so I've dropped the, the PDF of the presentation in the chat so that those of you who may want to um, follow along just by looking at the PDF instead of my shared screen um, are able to do that. Um, I do that for all my classes. Um, in advance, I post PDFs and I'll be talking about that. Um, so that uh, students who may feel like disoriented by the shared screen experience, um, it's kind of, you know, the, it's, it can be insane um, <laughs> for, um, for anybody, um, including um, especially students um, who may have um, barriers to following along, et cetera, um, or who get disoriented by a shared screen. Um, but I will be sharing my screen as well. Um, and I also wanted to let you know, and this is something I'm, I'm doing as part of this presentation to model um, what I do um, in the classroom. I can't do it with a class in French because um, uh, Zoom does not have um, live captioning in foreign languages yet, but if you would like to have the presentation captioned, you can click on the caption, um, I'm sorry, the live transcript button at the bottom of um, the Zoom screen, um, and then you'll have um, my transcript there. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, go ahead and start, um, and I wanted to um, uh, let you know that, you know, my presentation design is very straightforward, very simple, and that's on purpose, because um, I'm trying to show um, not how an exciting language lesson um, presentation would look, right, um, but something um, pretty bare bones, um, and it's something I'll talk about as well uh, when I get into that. Okay, um, so... Here we go. Um, and along the way, please let me know if anything is awry. Um, because I'm managing technology, as you guys know, um, is the case um, for you guys as well. Uh, I The chat may not appear um, to me. And so just um, let me know if something's funky. Okay. Um, and so um, I just wanted to give you guys a sort of um, plan on how the presentation will go um, organizationally. Uh, and I'm going to start with a little bit of information about myself, why I use the term CRIP, um, why uh, what I'm talking about today matters at USC and in our classrooms and for our students, etc. Um, and then I'll be doing um, kind of an outline of UDL and UDI, um, and I'll explain why I'm using UDI instead of um, UDL. And I'm going to pull up the screen here. There we go. Okay. Um, and then I have a few slides on tools for students and tools for us, um, practical and psychosocial approaches to accessibility, and then some random suggestions. And along the way, I'll be asking you guys to do stuff as well and guiding you through um, some things you can, um, you can implement. Um, simple or or a little bit more complicated. Okay, um, and so who I am um, and and where my interests lie, many of you already know. Um, but I come at this um, from a research perspective. I've been working in disability studies for a long time, um, and um, have been working also in crypt theories. It's kind of what my current project is all about. Um, with at the intersection of gender and the francophone world, notably um, West Africa. Africa, but I work um, across many, many different texts that have to do with health, disability, illness, um, history of medicine, etc. Um, and service-wise, I really um, 
uh, started to um, get much more committed in my practice as a teacher um, and as a leader um, when I served on the MLA Committee for Disability Studies, sorry, Disability Issues in the Profession, um, and then also um, simultaneously as Director of Undergraduate Studies, where I interfaced with a lot of students who needed a lot of support, um, and also advised professors on syllabi and all kinds of stuff. Um, and so I will be talking about the foreign language classroom for sure, but you'll see that a lot of the things that I'm talking about are also part of an upper division um, course um, and can be implemented um, across both. Um, okay, so. Um, First activity. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if anybody noticed, uh, if anyone's emailed me recently, but you'll see that in my email, um, I have a little notice here. Okay, if you can see that. Um, Julie Christine Van Dam, my full name, prefers accessible content. Okay, so this will always show up in my email as you put in my email address, um, and then you can click on that and check for accessibility issues. Okay, so I personally um, don't have a specific need in terms of accessibility vision hearing yet, who knows, um, uh, but it allows me to show to anybody who's communicating with me, especially my students, that I am an ally. I know what this means. I know um, that you also um, may require something like this, right? And I want them to be attuned to this. I want them to be sensitive to it. Okay, um, so if you would like to crypt your own email, okay, you are welcome to. Um, and I am gonna show you what that looks like because I hate these kinds of things like settings and then you go to the next thing and you go to the next thing. Okay, so I am going to um, um, show you basically how to, first of all, write accessible emails, okay, crypt friendly emails. Um, and this um, refers to font, visuals, graphics, GIFs, all kinds of different things that can show up in an email and not be accessible, okay? Um, and um, the next thing that you could do if you wanted to is to um, uh, include this on your email um, so that the first thing students see from you as you, you know, communicate with them for the first time is that you're aware of these things as the, um, you know, the OSAS representatives um, really underscored. Um, they are out there showing students that they're present, right, and that they are there to help. But students often are not going to, um, if they have any kind of shame or or um, misunderstanding or um, just shyness about identifying themselves as in need of accessibility, um, then they, uh, you know, may have trouble like taking the first step. And so this is a way to um, show them that you are there. Um, there's other ways too, which I will show you. Okay. Um, so basically, if you don't like to see all the text, um, these are the images of what you would do. So you go to settings. Okay. Then you go to view all outlook settings, mail. Okay. And then you go to customize actions. You're going to scroll all the way down and you just click on check for accessibility issues. Okay, so feel free to do that. Um, I also encourage you, I forgot to mention this, to um, exit full view. When I do um, a shared screen, I always um, advise my students to exit full view so they don't feel overwhelmed by the screen. And then they can also um, toggle between screens. Um, okay, and then I'll show you the next one. Okay, so this is how to identify yourself as an ally. Um, and go again, view all Outlook settings, mail, then you go to um, general, sorry, not mail, you go to general accessibility, and you just click that one little box, ask senders to send content that's accessible. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Is anybody even interested in doing this? Does it seem like something interesting? I'm curious. It seems like something important to do to invite students to um, make the first step to address whatever issue they're having. So okay, good, good, good. Okay. Um, I have I have a question, Julie, and this is where I'm. I'm. It's my lack of knowledge that's showing up. But um, 
when you do this, what happens? Does it, does, I mean, um, mm -hmm. how, how does the content become accessible? I mean, your email looks like, you know, I've received emails from you. So, yeah. you know, it looks like an email. Is there something I would then be by clicking on it? Would you then as the student or the person receiving that email uh, by clicking on check for access accessibility issues, then be able to make the font bigger, smaller, things of that, or what 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 happens from this? Point? Yeah, it would alert you to something that was impossible to um, to use a screen reader with, for example, um, like something um, like a like a, a a GIF or a JPEG that was introduced, like an image that was introduced without alt text. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll explain alt text. Um, so basically, if if you have a setting as identify yourself as an ally, that's one thing. You're just kind of asking people to send you something that's accessible. If you do the other, then it will alert you. Um, so far, I haven't had the alert. So I should try that to see what it looks like. I have not had an alert that like some of my content's not accessible. But that's a good question. I should try it out and see. Um, and I'm not, uh, you know, I, I should say too that as I'm presenting, you know, this stuff, there's so many things you can do. And I'm only presenting the things that work for me and that I find to be helpful. Um, so uh, yeah, and um, I don't know that I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm versed in it, but like, this is something I haven't tested out, but it's a really good good idea to test it out <laughs> uh, to see what would happen. Okay. Um, so what I mean when I say CRIP or some grounding theories um, of CRIP, CRIP technologies and CRIPing the classroom. Um, okay, I'm gonna smush this. Okay. Um, so um, this is something that's really um, a common, you know, known um, thing amongst disability studies and CRIP Crip theory, um, crip theory community, people committed to access, um, that retrofit is not um, something we should be thinking about. Like, oh, this student has an accommodation, therefore I'm going to do X, Y, or Z. Um, yes, of course, we have to work with individual students, um, but the idea of um, crip technologies and cripping the classroom is that you're creating a situation that all students can engage with and that you're not going to have to like individually for each and every student um, figure out what is the best way to provide them access. Um, and um, and so, um, you know, this is something too where I will be talking about CRIP, I will be talking about accessibility. I won't be talking about too much about, I won't be talking too much about disability. And as we saw in the talk last week, no, last month, sorry, from OSAS, um, the shift from disability to accessibility has happened um, across a number of different spaces. Um, and, you know, for OSAS, it was in, um, what year was it? 20. 20, um, sorry, 2021. And um, Debbie said that it had been in the works for a while, um, which is great, um, but accessibility um, is a term that allows us to sort of destigmatize what it means to be in the classroom and have um, a different neurological, socioeconomic, um, physical, mental makeup. Um, this shift happened for the MLA when I was on the committee for the um, MLA um, um, uh, disability issues in the profession um, uh, organization. Uh, we shifted the um, table name. So the table at the conference used to be called, um, you know, resources for people with disabilities. And then we shifted it um, while I was at the MLA to accessibility. So, um, and that was a really important shift. Um, and it's something that I really insist on in my classes as well. Um, and CRIP is a term that, while it sounds derogatory, is actually um, a, a term that has been retaken um, within the disability studies community um, to extend the idea of human variation, um, human difference, um, human variety. Um, and it allows us to see disability outside of this sort of paradigmatic view of disability. Um, <clears throat> it's a broader view of capacities, energy, neurology, psychology in response 
to or subject to ableist demands. And for many crypt theorists, they look at neoliberalism and the demands of capitalism on the body, on the mind, the sort of pro productivity model, et cetera. I won't get into that, but it exists in the academy as well, right? Um, and, um, and this is just a quote um, from Claire McKinney, um, whose piece, Cripping the Classroom, is um, in my work cited. Cripping highlights the category of disability as necessary to understand the myriad investments in ableist assumptions that operate in the everyday. And she's actually talking about the academy and the university classroom in that piece. And I highly recommend it for anybody who's interested. Okay. Um, and so why it should matter here at USC and in our classrooms. Um, I, um, I think for now, like the bulk of the resources that we have are offered through OSAS and um, CET. Um, and CET has some great um, videos. Unfortunately, they don't have them, they don't have UDL featured um, on the website. You have to search for it, um, which is weird. <laughs> think, but they're good. They're well-produced, they're clear, et cetera. Um, and actually Ingrid, Ingrid, oh, Ingrid, sorry, um, use, Steiner um, uses UDI, which I'll explain in a minute, as opposed to UDL um, in one of her videos. Um, and so I'm just quoting Madison Shaw here, and this goes back to this issue of paradigmatic disability and how CRIP um, works against this in a way. Um, so what she said um, was most of the students who are receiving services are not what people think of as their typical person with a disability. And this is why it's so important to identify yourself as an ally, to reach out first, um, and to think outside of a box of what we think of as a student who like needs accommodations, needs support, et cetera. Um, and so these are just some numbers that OSAS um, gave us um, last month. Um, and I um, talked to Atier to get the number of students in, in French courses. So the number of students who are registered with OSAS um, uh, compared to the number of, of all French students um, is about 8%. Um, and so when we think about, I, I, I'm going to assume that it's across, you know, all um, languages. Um, I didn't do, I didn't run all the numbers, but, um, but it shows you um, just the number of students who are, um, who are registered with um, OSAS. And that is not indicative of the numbers of students who have access needs, right? Just because they're registered doesn't, uh, um, just because um, they're not registered doesn't mean that they don't have access needs. Um, okay, so um, um, I wanted to, um, I'm gonna skip that, but um, feel free to use that link or um, the one on the Works Cited page to access um, some of the CET re resources, which are helpful, helpful, definitely for sure. Um, Sorry, Julie, um, what does UD stand for in that little table that you have in the middle? Oh, undergrads. Oh, oh under, why UD? Oh, you know what? I, thank you. <laughs> UD, I'm thinking of upper division. Whenever I like do a U, it's UD for upper division. It's undergrads, I'm so sorry. Thank you for the question. Okay, oh, okay. Um, so um, the foreign language classroom and UDL question mark? No, UDI. Um, so UDL um, is um, something that we hear about often. Um, and, um, but it's not really what I'm gonna talk about today. And UDL um, is something that works really well um, in a general sense, but UDI is something much more um, specific. Um, and um, and you wouldn't have come if it was about UDI because you've been like, what is that? Um, so UDL and you know I would have to say too that all of our classes are kind of UDL already, um, but um, there's some things I'll I'll show you um, about UDI um, that are more specific um, and that are um, that allow you to really um, support you know all students. Um, okay, so UDL in a nutshell, multiple means of representation. Okay, so different kinds of um, different kinds of um, materials, multiple means of action and expression, um, and multiple means of engagement. 
Um, I do have a poll here that I would like for you guys to do. I actually think um, if you can, I'm gonna, I just realized I need to, I'm gonna put that in there for you guys, the link. That was the one thing I, okay, here we go. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to pull that up. And it's basically um, to see where everybody is at. Still happening. Julie, while everybody's working on that, a question. Mm -hmm. Can we yeah. uh, share your PDF on CLC, um, CLC's website? Yes, 100%. Okay, thank you. Okay, so just waiting. I'm oh, sorry, my upstairs neighbor. Okay. Um, okay, I know about UDL, but don't know how to employ it in my pedagogy. Nice mix, 50-50, okay. Um, I know about UDL, okay, and a few of its principles in my pedagogy, yes or no, okay. So mostly uh, no. Hold on, sorry, next, okay. Okay, I know about UDL and try to use many of its principles possible. Good. I boy, I'm glad I'm doing some of this today. Okay. 50-50. Don't know much about UDL. Don't know how it could be useful in the foreign language classroom. This is very typical. Um, I feel confident in my ability. Wow, very interesting. Okay, good. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, and I feel support. Huh? Yeah, um, good. Um, I think this is uh, really telling uh, as well. And I think um, that what CET and um, OSAS have done is good. But I think that there's so much more that our departments um, I'm going to stop share um, that our departments can do uh, to support. Um, unfortunately, it can often be um, left up to, to the instructors. This is something that um, in our um, experience when students come from high schools, they are often, um, they've been shepherded the whole way through and they have a really strong support system. And then they arrive um, at university, they have to sort of figure it out on them, uh, you know, on their own. Um, and then it's up to us as non-experts in this field to implement these things. Um, and it can be um, extremely um, challenging, um, especially in the current, you know, uh, climate that we're in. It's much easier now, I think, because, um, things are slow, like things are getting normalized um, in terms of uh, COVID and the online environment. But, and I won't be specifically speaking to the online environment in this, but some of it. Okay, um, so this comes from um, uh, Wade Edwards and Sally Scott's Disability and World Language Learning. Um, 
And I wanted to give you guys just a brief overview. I won't be doing too much um, explanation here, but there are nine principles for UDI. Um, and um, in um, Edwards and Scott's work, they give kind of examples of what this would look like. Um, and most of this, a lot of this stuff is done already um, by faculty. Um, one thing um, that I would add, and, and I'll, I'll do this on the next slide too, is how, um, how early students um, often need um, these um, kinds of uh, um, uh, is, um, elements introduced into um, the class design, into um, the teaching practices, et cetera. Okay. Um, and so um, before I just realized, okay. So principle one is equitable use. Um, so uh, principle two, flexibility in use, and I'll come back to these. Um, principle three, um, simple and intuitive. And again, um, I believe that most of us do this already and perceptible information. So I feel that perceptible information might be um, uh, one of the things that can be difficult um, for um, faculty to um, really ensure because we tend to want to make things exciting, especially when you're presenting um, something through Google Slides or a PDF or um, um, PowerPoint, etc. Um, so the one thing I would remind everyone, um, and I'll come back, I, I, I'm, I think it's on my last slide as well, is that as exciting as we want to make it, um, textbooks already are very distracting, um, especially in the electronic versions. Um, and I would say to sort of turn down the volume on presentations um, so that students get don't get overwhelmed with too many graphics, too many GIFs, um, too many colors, et cetera. Um, I realize that my presentation is very, like extremely boring, um, but it's meant to be sort of an, a counterpoint to too much excitement, okay? Um, so the other thing um, that I really want to insist on is the importance of PDFing um, everything in advance, PDFing and posting it and letting students know, and I'll come back to this um, later. So letting students know day one in class that everything will be PDF'd in advance so that students who have a hard time engaging or who might have processing um, delays or have just a different need um, for how to engage with the materials can look at things in advance, prep a question, prep a response, or just know what to expect. Okay, um, so the other thing um, that I want to show you is how to do alt text. Okay, um, and many of you probably already know how to do this, um, but this is a really important aspect of UDL and UDI and accessible, um, you know, pr providing uh, accessible materials. Um, so I did a test page, um, describe your images and ask students to do the same. I make it part of the grade. So when they're getting assessed, my rubric will say, and I'll show you um, in a sec, um, you know, that a certain percentage of their grade goes to accessibility. Okay, so they've posted the presentation in advance. They have alt texted every single image. Okay, and I show them how to do that. Um, and it's very easy in Google, uh, docs and Google Slides. Okay, some students prefer to actually just include a description, right, um, of the image into their presentation or what have you. Um, some and they they ask me, well, how do you know if I've alt texted it? You know, um, and I will look for sure. I do not verify every single image, um, but I'm you know I say um, okay that I check and I. I do check it. I don't just say I check it. I check it, but I don't check every single image. Okay. Um, but once they get in the habit of doing it, it becomes second nature and they often will then do it for all of their classes and all of their presentations because it makes everything um, available to everyone. Okay. So if you look at alt text um, here, I did it in French. So I have a little title and then I have a little description. Okay. 
Um, an orange cat wearing a cliche French outfit, a black beret, a striped top, and a red scarf. Okay, that's it. Um, so that's uh, doing alt text. Um, and, you know, that would be for um, students who, okay. Are you seeing just the presentation? Are you seeing my whole? Just the presentation. Just the present. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is for students who um, uh, use screen readers, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, who can access the image otherwise. Okay. Oops. Okay. Um, another two more principles of uh, UDI tolerance for error, which I believe that we all implement. Um, and by the way, all of these principles too are in concordance with the actful five C's. Okay. Um, low physical effort. So this um, is a little bit of a confusing um, principle just in, in thinking about, right? But um, the example, you know, allow students to use, you know, tablets, um, laptops, what have you. Um, and I allow this in my class as well, um, in my classrooms. I used to not um, in the past, pre-COVID, because um, I thought they were just, you know, well, and even, I guess in the last five years, I've, I've allowed this um, because students um, engage with the materials in different ways. And um, I've learned to come from a place of generosity instead of suspicion. That's kind of my, okay. Um, so also something to think about when we're doing kinetic activities, make sure that um, any activities involving movement, moving around the class or whatever are accessible for all. This is for the case of like a, um, a um, permanent um, mobility um, impairment or perhaps temporary. We have so many students, right, who are athletes who get injured, et cetera. Um, and we wanna create an environment that allows people to move around. I know it can be difficult, especially in classrooms where there are tons of tables um, for that to happen. Um, but um, it's something to consider if you are, you know, if you have activities where students are um, are asked to to move. Um, so another like low physical effort, and also um, it supports um, other principles is to consider flexible deadlines. Um, and so flexible deadlines um, uh, refer back to um, the the principle of flexibility of use, but it also um, means for low physical effort in the fact that um, if a deadline is um, available to them to decide on, right, it allows them to structure their weeks. They know um, what, uh, what um, needs to take priority over what, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, it also um, removes the stress from the day of turn in, right? So um, I will never ever go back to a day where, um, you know, a student brings in a printed paper that will never ever happen again <laughs> for me. It is way too stressful for them. It is stressful for me because they are exhausted after staying up all night writing the paper. Um, and so I've implemented flexible deadlines into my upper division classes um, and it's worked wonders and it is very, very rare that I have a student ask for an extension um, or that a paper is late, frankly. Um, okay, um, and so um, these are uh, three, uh, the, the three last principles, size and space, community of learners and instructional climate. Um, and so for instructional climate, I would just say, Day one, post and teach, um, a list of commonly used phrases or questions. Um, it gives students a sense of ease in the foreign language classroom, which is al already a space of stress for many students. Um, and um, to allow them to practice them, I'm sure many of you do that. This is not high tech anything, um, but it definitely gives students a sense of comfort from, from uh, day one, okay? Um, in the target language, of course. Okay, um, and so um, these are um, you know tools for students and tools for us. Um, I have a few things here. Um, so um, well before the first day of class, if you can get the syllabus up 
weeks in advance, that is awesome. It doesn't always happen. Um, but I really believe in accessible syllabi. Um, the syllabus really sets a tone for the class. Post it early, PDF it, simplify it, do bullet points, but not a lot of um, caps or bold. So that's why that's crossed out. Avoid caps. Um, uh, too many caps and too many, um, too many, too much font in bold. Um, and then I would also say, um, maybe I'll ask you how many, and you can show, you can raise your hand. How many of you have noticed and checked out the new Blackboard features on like PDF things? Anything or like a Word doc or anything that's um, I mean that little thing that tells you whether it's um, how accessible it is. Yeah, it allows students um, and I'm going to stop share because I um, I want to pull that up for you. So it allows students to download um, various um, content in um, different ways. Um, and I won't. Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna show you. Okay, so uh, here, okay, um, you see all the different formats that are available. So H HTML, okay, so there's so many different things here. And obviously um, some of them, the student would need the software to do it, right? Electronic Braille. Um, but audio is something that can be really helpful for students um, who may have text um, impairments, right? So um, um, another way, of, and I actually allow students to post discussion board um, comments in audio. I give them like a few minutes, like instead of 150 words, they have to do a two minute post um, in audio. And some students really prefer to do that. In my um, French language classes, I have them do that as well. Um, they obviously do that on homework, but um, some of the homework exercises online. Um, but this allows them to do something much more personal. They're, they may not be being assessed for grammar or what have you. Um, but remember that so much of this work is not just in, um, oh, that exists, that's great, but being able to tell students about it. So show them um, and don't assume, um, don't assume that they know or don't assume that they're like, oh yeah, cool, I, you know, <laughs> like I, I can do this. Um, some students are still figuring out their, um, their needs. Um, and this is something that I um, do for my syllabi, I include an accessibility statement. My accessibility statement is also on this survey um, that I send out to students in advance. Um, and I um, have given everybody access to that. So I'm going to click on this and I'm going to also send it to you now. Um, you are welcome to, um, okay, you're well, I'm putting it in the, sorry, in the chat. Okay. You're welcome to adapt it as you wish. Um, but something to note is that this is a copy. And if you want to use any of this, make a copy for yourself and then edit it. Okay. Um, and so I start my syllabi with an accessibility statement. It's, it's like right after the course description. Um, and I ask students to read it before they complete the form. Um, I encourage you to look through it. I'm, we don't have time um, now, but I want to um, provide this to my students because often um, the OSAS information is at the end of the syllabus or um, maybe not something that just comes up on day one, right? But I send this form out before they get, they come to class and I ask them to read the accessibility statement before class, I mean, before completing the form, excuse me. Um, and I let them know where I'm coming from. Um, I also let them know that um, an accessible space is not always comfortable, that an accessible space um, is always what I strive to do, but there will be moments, right, of um, 
that require effort. And I call that an effortful, effortful space. Um, Oh, because you have access to it, but not, I think. Okay, I'll, fi I'll figure that out. I'll figure that out, Andrea. I thought I gave everybody editing, editing capabilities. Um, okay, I'll, I'll figure that out. Um, okay, um, I also um, let them know that um, they may or may not have an official accommodation at this point. But even if they do not have an official accommodation, I ask them to talk to me about their needs. They do not have to disclose anything. That is something very important um, to note when you're talking to students. Um, but um, I want them to know that, for example, um, if they haven't been able to, um, if they haven't been able to get to the um, to OSAS yet, or perhaps um, they have some kind of barrier to doing that, or they um, they didn't have any kind of accommodation in high school and therefore they don't know what they could have, et cetera, um, then talk to me and I will um, see what I can do um, to the best of my ability. Um, and so you can feel free to look through this and adapt it as you wish. Again, I'll check on the, I'll check on the, um, on the um, form um, how you can have access to it. Okay, um, and these are a lot of general questions and then more specific about their um, their feelings in the classroom, et cetera. Okay, so I have five minutes, so I'm going to go through these really quickly. Um, so the first week of class, I would just say, um, just as a reminder, um, to tell them about the PDFs that are posted in advance, to reply to, access, to, reply to the accessibility surveys, and then um, um, that what it means to be in a community of learners is that all of us are involved in access. Um, and this is why I have, this is um, a, a rubric for one of my um, classes, actually most of my classes, um, accessibility, they have, it's 5% um, is given to accessibility, but you see that like legibility of slides, visuals, all that stuff is still involved in, um, in providing access. Okay, and you see like an F is like they forget the alt text, they don't upload the PDF, etc. They're long text passages on the slides. Okay, and remember to show them how to do alt text. Okay, so essentials and planning, um, I'm, not, I'm almost done. Captioning, um, I would really, really um, urge you to source and use only those videos that can be closed captioned, um, either in the target language if desired or subtitled in English. OK, um, and, you know, uh, if you have someone in class who is deaf or hard of hearing, then you can actually have OSAS caption anything you want and they're great at it. Um, but unless you have somebody with an accommodation, um, you can't they have that like official work done and all of the captioning and transcript services, Otter AI, all that stuff um, is really um, through um, is really only in English unless you're using um, Google Docs, um, and I'll just like 30 seconds on that. I want to, I'm not going to show this to you, but for every online activity that has an audio, there is a script, at least in MH Connect, which is the platform that um, we use in French. Um, and I, I would encourage you to show your students that there is a script below. In the past, it was like, oh, they should just figure it out, like let them listen to it. But this is for many, many different kinds of students. My kid has loved captioning since the time they were little and it has been amazing for vocab, for comprehension. I love it too. I caption everything um, because then I don't have to listen to it so loud. Okay, um, how Google Drive can help. So um, in um, Google Slides and Docs, okay, and I'm, I'm gonna show you these two things really, really quick and then I promise I'm done. We're going back to my test. Okay, so you go to tools, accessibility settings, and then you can turn all this on for people, okay? And you can show students how to do that as well. For voice typing, you go to voice typing. This is something where a transcript could be produced. 
A closed captioning could be produced if you're playing the video, the audio at the same time. So you would just do this. Okay, and then you put it into, okay. Oh, whoops. Dans cinq minutes, j'aurai fini. There we go. And done. Okay. Um, and this can be something that students appreciate that you can use, et cetera. Okay, random suggestions. Whoops. Okay, stick to the basics. Don't go overboard, as I already said. Don't use tons of different, you know, colors and 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 various um, sizes and shapes and all that jazz. Um, I would say on presentations too, um, font no smaller than fourteen point. That's something I grade my students on as well. And the other thing is, I feel like we can think more um, generously. <laughs> um, Instead of assuming that students are trying to get away with something, be a little maybe less likely to think that. <laughs> um, and um, I used to have that way of thinking. I try not to um, at all anymore. Um, and I try to read them um, as, as well as I can um, and communicate with them. Um, and remember to be the first one to reach out. Don't wait for students to communicate their needs to you. Many, many, many many will not. Okay, um, and these are some um, resources for you. Um, and I am done. Thank you very much, Julie. Thank you for all this very interesting and useful information and for sharing the tools that will help us support our students. I was going to ask a question about assessment, mm -hmm. how we apply all this in assessment. Uh, but maybe we will need to have a, you know, bigger conversation on that some other time. And I will let um, others mm -hmm. ask questions now. Mm -hmm. Any questions um, from the participants? You can just unmute yourself and ask. So Julie, when you do um, give out assignments, uh -huh. uh, not just, not, I'm not talking just about tests, but of course, testing is also of interest, but um, is, do you, you give out different alternatives for them to complete the assignment? I mean, uh, it's not always gonna be uh, yoga saying like. Possible, you know, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah, and I, um, as you know, within the basic language program, I think that um, what I do with you know the homework that that we assign, um, luckily there are many different ways that they can access materials. They can do it through like fill in the blank, or they can do it through open ended questions, or they can engage with an image and write about the image, or they listen to something. And so I feel like already in the in the basic language program, most of the um, I think we all kind of operate in that way. But um, now that so much more is is electronic, there are um, there is built in support. Like in the past, I would have to ask, can I get the transcript for something? Can I get, you know, so that students can have, um, you know, access to like the audio and also to to the text um, for my upper division classes? Um, I do allow for different kinds of assignments. So they have to do a certain amount of writing, but for their final projects, they can either do a traditional research paper um, or they do a multimedia project. Um, and they then design their own kind of, like some people do super high tech, some people do like a Google Slides thing where they're bringing in um, images and you know audio visual or whatever, but they still have to do writing on that and they're still doing an argumentative piece um but i do support you know different modes i don't i'm not as extreme as some people in the disability studies community in terms of flexibility on deadlines or um or uh yeah allowing students to do like a poster board instead of a research paper or something like that um 
yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just think about, I mean, I think we have an assignment coming up where students have to watch a film. And mm -hmm. so students, you know, who, for instance, who are visually impaired, they can't, I mean, uh, they can listen to a film, but they can't watch a film. And so I'm just wondering if we should be offering them a different kind of assignment altogether. Yeah, and that's a good question for classes that rely heavily on film um, or any kind of film, frankly. Um, you know, that's something I, I feel that, um, for students who are visually impaired, for the most part, what I've um, come across is that they have, for the most part, um, an arsenal of softwares that um, allow for the film, for example, you hear the dialogue and then you're also hearing um, a narration, kind of like alt text that exists where they hear a narration of what's going on in the background. Um, so obviously like engaging with it um, in an analytical, on an analytical level, you may change the assignment a little bit, but um, because they're not able to necessarily access the visual per se, but they can access the narration about the visual and, and, and that is something that does exist. And, and if a student, I would say if a student does have a visual impairment, but has not gotten accommodations for that or, or has like tools to access visual, um, um, you know, materials, then that's where we could come in and say like, oh, OSAS can help you um, figure that out, you know? Does that make sense? Because I've, I've watched films before with that narration in the background and it's very weird, but I mean, it's very weird for us. It seems like um, it's it a lot of that process all at once. If you're listening to the dialogue and then you're also listening to a description of what's going on visually, then I don't, I don't know. I think I would... actually, Andrea, it's really great because it's, it's like a novel. Mm -hmm. And so I actually use it in my writing classes where they actually see you when you're watching the film. So all of the parts of what you're seeing, then when you use that feature, which they have on Netflix, most films that you see on Netflix, you can choose that. And so it's narrating everything that they're seeing. So it gives them an idea of how to narrate a story actually, and how you know to describe and the sounds that they hear. So it's done very well. It's as if they're reading a novel, but it actually says, now you see a person crossing the street and describes the person. So it refers to what they're seeing. And so the person who's listening knows that that's, you know, that that's a voice added part onto it, mm -hmm. but it's actually very good. Take any film. I think most films on Netflix um, have that feature right now. And it's actually a great thing to use. Mm -hmm. I just figured out why you couldn't edit it because I sent you the form. I, I sent you the form as if you're responding. This is the link to the survey with my accessibility statement that you are now all collaborators on, should you wish. <laughs> but that's where if you open it, make sure to make a copy for yourselves first. Because if Andrea and like Francesca are in it, then you're editing each other's one. Does that make sense? And if you have any suggestions or whatever for um, the questions I ask, I would love to hear them. Um, this has been something I edit frequently and mix, you know, mix up a little bit. And I had it very specifically oriented towards online learning for you know, <laughs> however long we were 100% online and now I um, adapted it to in-person or back to in-person, I should say. Thank you for sharing that, Julie. I will probably make a copy and then share that copy with um, faculty on CLC's website along with the recording. So okay, awesome. Yeah, please do. I've shared it. Um, I shared it in some other... It was some talk or some, I can't yeah, remember. We shared, it, we shared it when uh, there was a talk about after the whole fraternity business went oh, down. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, that. that's right. You were there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so very much. This was very interesting, fascinating for me personally. There's a lot I don't know. I'm sure others also found um, lots of useful information. 
Uh, thank you all for joining us. This recording, um, along with the resources that Julie shared, will be available on CELC's um, website sometime soon. This was our last um, event this semester. I'm sure we're going to ask Julie to come back and talk about accessibility, accessibility and assessment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to That's ask you about that. I, whoa, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but thank you so much for sharing this information and thank you all for joining us. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Have a great weekend. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.